Our lesson today is entitled, What If Jesus Had Not Been Born? And there are all kinds of ramifications that come with that kind of a thought. I want to begin today by saying that December is the month in which we think of the birth of Christ. It's all around the world. It is uh, in America. It is in China. It's wherever you want to go. People are celebrating Christ, Christ's birth. Now, some of them do not celebrate it on the 25th of December. Some of them celebrate, for instance, on the 6th of January. And so you have the 12 days of Christmas. It's 12 days from the 25th of the 6th, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> we do not know when Christ was born, okay? So uh, remember that as we go through this lesson. But he is God. And he came here to earth to save us. And it is appropriate for us to remember him. He shows us what life is all about. It's standing before the Father and putting himself out there to, here is how you serve God. Here is what reality is. And Scott was talking in the earlier lesson this morning about how that they were doing it wrong. And they were. But Jesus shows us, here's what it's all about. But this morning... I want us to think about what would it be like if he had not been born. And I want to start in the Bible. If he had not been born. Then the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. It was prophesied of his birth. It was prophesied the time. It would be according to Daniel 2. It would be in the realm of the uh, Roman uh, Empire couldn't get it out. <laughs> the place, according to Micah, is Bethlehem, Ephrata. Isaiah said he'd be born of a virgin, laid in a manger, and heaven would rejoice. That's what the, old, the Bible says. But if it didn't happen, then the prophets would be wrong. And God said if a prophet speak anything presumptuously and it not come to pass, he is not a prophet, you shall not be afraid of him. They'd be wrong. Now if they're wrong about that, can you really trust anything in the Bible? If they're wrong about Jesus being born, can you trust that creation happened as the Bible said it did? Can you trust that he's going to come back again when he was never born? Can you trust there's going to be a judgment? Can you trust there's going to be a heaven? Can you trust there's going to be a hell? And everything between. You can't trust anything. And all that God has said to us will be questionable. All of it. But I'm thankful for the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18. He says it's impossible for God to lie. And because the Bible says that and because the Bible is God's word and because it's impossible for him to lie. Jesus was born. But if Jesus had not been born, then Jesus did not die for our sins because he wasn't even here. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 spends a long time concerning the resurrection. But in order for the resurrection to have happened, he had to have been born. He had to have died. And so that would be impossible if Jesus had not been born. And that chapter goes on and it says, and if that's not the case, then we're still guilty of every sin we've ever committed. Not only that, but your faith is in vain. We that preach, we preach in vain. 
And those who died have just gone on. That, that's over with for them. And there's no hope. Verse 19 says, And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have, are of all men most miserable. And so we're wasting our time here if Christ has not been born and there'd be no eternal hope. What a gloomy outcast. Do you know why I say I don't like this lesson? Because it really is a downer. It puts you down. It depresses you. It just destroys everything that's positive. And you know what? The world demonstrates that. We go back. History shows that Rome was a decadent society. Now there are lots of words you can use instead of decadent. You want to use uh, uh, ugly. You want to use bad. You want to use ungodly. You want, and, you know there are just a whole lot of negative things that you can use there. That's what Rome was. But before I get into what Rome did, I want you to know that in the world at that time, Rome was the best place to live. And to be a Roman citizen was the best thing that you could have. And Paul was arguing with one of the kings and the king says, I got this citizenship by a great sum of money. And Paul says, I was free born. So it, it was a thing to be desired, and it was terrible. They enslaved people. They'd go and they'd conquer a, a country over here, and they would take the very best and the strongest people, and they'd bring them back to be their slaves. And they didn't have any value on life. If one of those slaves kicked up, they just killed them. And if a Roman citizen were condemned for a crime, they just kill you. Yeah, they had their jails. They had their dungeons. They didn't feed you. I experienced that once in Trinidad. I saw the, <clears throat> the prison. It wasn't very big because they didn't have very many prisoners. Yeah. They locked you up in there. There were no guards in there. There were no sails. It was just a 30 foot tall wall. No beds, no bathrooms. They didn't feed you. If your family didn't bring you food, you die. And since no everybody else is in the same situation, it's in there and they're all free to mingle. You had to fight to keep your food. And they took children from the schools and told them, look at that. You commit a crime, that's where you're going, and you will die there. They valued life. The Romans didn't. And the only concern of the country was that they served the emperor and whatever he wanted to do. And you know what was on the emperor's mind? How can I keep this power? How can I keep in office, if you want to put it that way? And if you rebel against him, he kills you. That's terrible, folks. But that's not even the half of it. Because you see, the Jews, who were God's chosen people, were just as bad. You know what a zealot is? <clears throat> He's a Jew who has sworn to kill all the Roman soldiers he can. And so at night they carry these knives or swords in their cloaks. And they come up behind a Roman soldier and they either put it through his heart or they slit his throat. And then run off. And some scholars think that Brother Peter was a zealot. 
That's why he had the sword in the garden and cut off Malchus's ear. I don't know whether that's true or not. But the Jews, they condemned Stephen to be stoned. The Jews, they delivered Jesus over to be crucified, an innocent man. They're just as bad as the Romans. Oh, and don't leave us out because if you take Jesus out of our life, guess what? We're just as bad as they are. And we only separate ourselves from them as much as we put Jesus in our life. You may see that and you may not. So let's bring it a little closer to home. Nazi Germany. Mm. They exterminated over 6 million Jews. And after the war was over, there were war crimes that they were charged with. Government officials were. Corrie ten Boom. Anybody ever hear her? Yeah, she was uh, from Holland. And on February, I've got it written down here, February the 28th, 1944, the Gestapo came in and arrested all of her family and everybody that was at her house. There were over 30 people that were arrested that night. Four days later, her daddy was dead. They had been sheltering the resistance to the Nazis. And they had been hiding Jews from extermination. And her life story is a wonderful story. But it's about this evil, evil time. They were charged with massacres. Mass rape. Looting. The exploitation of forced labor. The murder of three million Soviet uh, prisoners of war. And of course they participated in the Jewish extermination. This piece of glass that you handled, you know what that was? In the spring of 1944, Lily's uncle was stationed in West Berlin. And he and a couple of three other soldiers wanted to see the Third Reich headquarters, which is located in the West Sector. And at that time, the Russian soldiers on their day off could go into the East, and the American soldiers on the East Side, I mean, on the West Side, could go into the East. And so they went. They went to the Third Reich headquarters. They told the guard that was on the door that there was a Freud line around the corner looking for a man. And he took off. And they went in. That piece of glass that you handled, it was the paperweight off Adolf Hitler's desk. That's an innocent piece of thing that God made. And yet it's tied to so much evil. That if I told you what it was before, many of you would not have touched it. And the difference is, you know, Jesus. How many times did he pick that thing up and put a piece of paper under it? There was a stack of papers under it, and it was the order for the food for the month of May for the army. I said, why didn't you bring that stack of papers home? He said, oh, I didn't have a place to keep them. He said, put that in my pocket. How many times did he hold it up in the light and let the sun come through it and cast rainbows on the white walls of his office? I don't know. That is innocent. 
the evil was from somebody else. Russia. Russia is an atheistic society today, and they're backward. I want you to know that. Now, if you talk about them in the terms of the world, we count them as a modern society. They have an atheistic-sponsored church. It's a Greek Orthodox church. We have some people going over there to study the Bible with them, but let me talk to you a little bit about 1986. We captured a Russian MiG fighter. Actually, what happened was the pilot took off from a Russian base. He went over the mountaintop and he went down under the radar and he headed for an American base and the Americans interceded him and took him home with them. Our people took that MiG fighter apart because we were scared to death of that MiG fighter. It had a really powerful engine. It was really fast. But everything else in it was World War II technology. There was a hole in the dashboard of that plane. They couldn't figure out what in the world was it. So they called the pilot. What is this hole? He said, oh, that's the clock. That's the clock? Yeah, I have to bring my alarm clock and put it in there, in that hole. And his alarm clock was a wind-up alarm clock. Yeah. No. They're not. Ex yeah, they do some nuclear stuff. They got that from us. They stole the information they had from us. My daughter Christy made two trips to Russia. 1994 1996. While she was there, she and a nurse were walking down the street and they came upon this man who had been run over by a car. And he had a broken leg. And so they started fixing his leg with a splint and so they could get him to the hospital. He said, what are you doing? Why are you helping me? Because in Russia, you get hurt. Nobody helps you. They got him to the hospital, and the, the, the people that were, took him in, I guess a receptionist, I don't know, they wanted to know, what's your relationship to him? <laughs> Nothing. We just brought him in. He needed help. Why would you do that? The doctor came to see him. He asked the same questions. And then he said, what is that on his leg? In 1996, when that happened, the doctor did not know what a splint was. She went to a banquet. They served borscht. You know what borscht is? It was the main course of the meal in the banquet. It's boiled beets with lard. She said it gagged her. Mm. She brought home for me this watch. I'll get it off here in a minute. It's a KGB watch. It keeps wonderful time if you wind it. But you see, it is self-winding watch. You still have to wind it. You can get 24 hours of perfect time out of this watch if you stand there and you shake it like this for at least 45 minutes. <laughs> It was the latest in technology in 1994, I think, is when she brought this. It might have been 96. I don't know. It keeps good time. I shook it for 30 minutes this morning. It's still running. It's got good time on it. Craziness. Now, Russia may be on the brink of collapsing. 
They used up most of their war materials except for the nuclear. They've expended most of their men of that age. They've killed hundreds of thousands. They've solicited war material from China. And China is now sending them their soldiers. You need to know something else at this point. The United States has over 20,000 soldiers over there right now. They're in Poland, not in Ukraine. But we're getting ready. History shows that without Christ, this is the way the world goes. Learning's not important, just power. Who is the strongest? That's the one that will survive. And in a country where learning is not important, the only thing important is servitude, that you should serve your country. And by service, I don't mean like we serve in the armed forces. I mean everybody gives to the government. And not just taxes, but goods, produce. All kinds of things. And if society develops at all, it will always be sensual and it will never be positive. Let's bring this a little closer to home where you can understand it. There's a place in California called San Francisco. There are a few Christians still there, but most have left. Homosexuality is the norm. They burn businesses for fun. They loot other businesses. They murder people and are not punished. That's what you get when Jesus is not there. You see why I didn't like this lesson? But it's reality. And as real as those things are, Jesus is real too. So I'm going to close this thing out with a long but. <laughs> I'm not through yet. I got some stuff for you. Christians believe that Christ was born and thank God for this time of year when the whole world seems to be turning its attention to Jesus. And we who are in the church need to say thank you God that they do. And we need to join them in praising God for this gift of Jesus. Amen. Because that changes everything. All that negativity, all that ugly stuff, all that bad stuff, Jesus changes everything. Scott was talking about divorce this morning in his lesson for a little bit. And I thought, now what if the couple would just stop and pray before they got the divorce? What would happen if they invited Jesus in to solve the problem? What would happen in that? There'd be fewer divorces. But people, we have been given the task of changing the world with this message. In many of those atheistic societies I talked about a while ago, the Bible is being used to study English. That's why Christie went to Russia. The message is so refreshing. It's so different from what they hear there. That they're flocking to it. You can't keep them away from it. In China, the house churches are cropping up everywhere. It's against the law to be a Christian in China. But they're still underground going there. That's why Brad Forge that used to preach here is living in China now. 
It's growing faster there than anywhere else in the world. India. Hundreds of churches are being uh, established. Over 14 million people. And that was five or six years ago. There's no telling how many are there now. Doug Tackett. He's made his presentation on India work right here. He and his brother have a mission field in India. They have established a preaching school. They have established an orphanage that is overrunning with kids. And they graduate 20 or 30 every semester. Preachers who go out into the, the country of India and preach the gospel. So I want you to know that even though there is a lot of negativism in the world and a lot of people around the world, including here in the United States, live as though Jesus had never been born. God is still at work in the world today. Yeah. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, one of the last things that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and the uttermost parts of the earth it's the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew go into all the world and preach the gospel yeah to preach it to all nations preach it to every creature Teaching them. There's your key. If you want to change society, you teach the society. And whatever the society turns out to be will depend upon what they've been taught. You want the society to be godly, you teach them about God. You want them to be a Christian, you teach them about Jesus. You want them to be uh, uh, like we have in most of the country today. Ugly, I'll put it that way. <laughs> then you teach them, you deserve this, you deserve that. That's what Scott was talking about this morning too. So our task... Since we believe that Jesus was born, is to put Christ in our world. It starts with me. It starts with you. Put Christ in my world. By the life that we live. By the life we live. Let it be above the standard of the world. Not because we think we're better, but because we're forgiven. And because we need to serve the Lord and not the world. And that will put a separation there. By our lives. Let us put Christ in the world by our worshiping. It is important that we give him praise and honor for our benefit. But it's important for those around us that they see we are people who serve him. Here is my service, Lord. Here I am. Take me. Let us put Christ in the world by our speech. The way we talk, then, because other people hear us. And if I talk ugly, they know I'm not a Christian. And if I talk about the Lord, and if I talk about godly things, if I talk about the eternity, they know what I believe and know who I am. And so we will become the witnesses for Christ on earth today. We. I've underlined that. I made that in bold for you. We. It's not just the Sunday school teacher, the song leader, the preacher. It's we, all of us, are witnesses for the Lord.
And I want to tell you something. We're a member of the greatest movement in all of history. Do you know what the difference is between Russia and the United States? What it should be, what it has been. Our country was founded upon Christian principles. Our country was founded by people who believed in God and believed in the Bible. That's what's made the difference. But does take it better than that. Because you see, we are a member of the greatest movement in Christianity that has ever been. I just mulled over Hebrews 12 on this. You've not come to the mountain that can be touched with hands. But you've come into Mount Zion, the holy city of God, his home. You've come into the company of angels. You've come into the company of God himself and to the spirits of just men who've completed their, their trek of faith. You are in the presence of of God Almighty. And so each Lord's Day we come here. And we worship to be renewed. And hopefully we read our Bible at home. And we pray at home. In order to be renewed. Because the evil of the world will suck it right out of you. When I told you what this was, there were some of you, ooh. I held that. Ooh. And some of you even got more of the disinfectant. And I know it wasn't because you were afraid of one another. You wanted the evil washed off. That's what the blood of Jesus does to us every day. Be renewed. And be a witness. Christ was born. And folks that changes everything. Amen.